Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Arfat and welcome to a brand new video. Today's video I'd like to provide a discussion on Jewish Hellenism, um, meaning Jews that have been Hellenized ever since the conquest of Alexander of Macedon or Alexander the Great after the 3rd century BCE up to the 1st century CE. So there's an overlap here between the Jews and the uh, early Christians. Now the reason why I'm doing this video is because this is a very fascinating fascinating topic of discussion and there's a lot of misunderstanding to this and there's also a lot of different opinion. I'll be coming from one side of the um, scholarly opinion and I'll provide my reasons as to why I adopt this opinion uh, compared to the other opinions, the various opinions out there. Now, the study of Jewish Hellenism, what does it mean? What does Jewish Hellenism basically mean? Um, Jewish Hellenism basically means Jews that is living from um, before the Common Era, um, ever since the conquest of Alexander of Macedon. Um, they have adopted Greek philosophy and they have been influenced by Greek philosophy um, and they have been exposed to Greek culture and mythology and it has somewhat um, um, influenced them in their theology. Okay, I repeat, Greek philosophy has somewhat influenced Jewish theology and understanding of the nature of the divine. What does this really mean, the nature of the divine? Now, in Greek philosophy, there's many kinds of divinities out there. Um, there's one supreme god right at the top, and there's human, and in between them is what we call the diamonds or the demiurge, or, or angels, or, or spirits, or, or human gods, or, or whatever it is you want to call it. Um, but all these are somewhat divine figure as well, okay? because they're not human, and they're also not the most supreme god. Um, and so there's somewhere in between, and they're in between the realm of the divine and the realm of human. But they're also somewhat divine uh, as well. Um, and Jewish thought and theology before Hellenism, before the conquest of Alexander the Great, um, can be considered by majority of scholars to be monotheistic, okay, in a sense. And I say this in a sense because there's a couple of Jews out there, or should we call Israelites, before the Babylonian conquest, um, whereby they worship Baal, okay, they worship uh, Ashira, Ashtate, even, um, and in in ancient Egypt, okay, they have been exposed to the pantheons of the Egyptian uh, gods in the Pleroma and things like that, and and so monotheism is living alongside henotheism, okay, those who believe in pantheons of deities. But what does it really mean to be a monotheist in the ancient world? A lot of scholars don't believe that there's such thing as monotheists in the ancient world. Um, and there's also a couple of scholars, a very small minority, that actually believe that there's uh, a, a sense of monotheist um, doctrine, if you want to call it, or belief or principle of life uh, in a sense. I'm just using this word monotheism um, in a very broad term because there were eight in our discussion uh, later on. Um, so what does it really mean to be a monotheist in the ancient world? Uh, if you are familiar with the Hebrew Bible, um, the Christian Old Testament, you'll know that a lot of the prophets, the minor prophets, the major prophets, they came to correct people. Uh, for example, in, in um, Israel and before the split, okay, uh, sorry, before the, the Assyrian conquest of Israel, um, whereby the monarchy was divided after the time of Solomon, the son of Solomon. He lost the, the control of, the, of Judah, which is the south of Israel, and of Israel, um, the northern part. Um, and even after that, um, we know that the Israelites, they worship the Canaanite god. And which is why we have prophets like Elijah, uh, Elisha, uh, and Isaiah, and things like that, uh, to bring people back to monotheism. 
And so we do know that hypnotism or paganism, polytheism, um, is living, uh, I'm using the word living here, yeah, you, you get what I mean, um, is present among uh, those who practice monotheism. Okay? Because Isaiah many times say that worship God and even Moses worship God alone. Okay, the Torah and the, the Pentateuch is very clear in uh, in this. The Shema Yisrael Adonai, okay, and things and things like that. Your Lord is your God. Lord is one. Echad, the Hebrew word there. And so Moses is definitely, if we believe the Pentateuch to be the word of Moses, which I don't believe, okay, but if we just um, at, we just commit this and say that the Pentateuch is the word uh, of Moses, Deuteronomy, okay, for example. Um, then the Shema would be um, dedicated to Moses. Okay, Moses preached the Shema. And so Moses is telling people that there's only one God. Okay, and this is monotheism. Okay, to profess there's only one God is monotheism. Um, but modern scholars, um, Islamic scholars, would deny this to be monotheism because there is no mention of La Ilah, okay, meaning there's no God. Okay? La ilaha illallah, meaning there's no God but Allah, besides Allah, the one true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. But we're not concerning ourselves with Islamic theology, uh, reading backwards into Jewish um, theology uh, of the ancient Israelites, uh, because there will be anachronism. And so we are leaving Islamic theology aside here, we're just looking at it from the Jewish perspective and as well as the early Christian perspective. And so there's a couple of um, discussions there, scholarly debates, things like that still happening um, um, today, books still being produced, um, things like that. Um, but my opinion was that um, the ancient Israelites um, and as well as the Jews before Hellenism um, were somewhat monotheists. Okay, somewhat monotheists, that's my position here. Okay. Um, somewhat monotheists because they practice the Shema but they do not reject uh, the, the divinity surrounding them okay? and that is somewhat monotheistic to me um, but if we follow the opinion of majority of the scholars um, like Paula Fredrickson for example she don't believe that um, there's such thing as monotheism okay, the monotheism um, of the past is different from more modern understanding of what monotheism really is. Okay? And so, to be a monotheist um, in the ancient world um, is you can believe in there is one supreme deity right at the top, but not necessarily you have to reject the other form of divinities as well. And so, through this, we can also say Plato was a monotheist, Aristotle was a monotheist, because they believe that there's one supreme deity, but this deity has, has minimal or nothing to do with the, the, the earth. Okay? That is the position of uh, Aristotle and Plato and, and things like that. Um, and so we can also say then that the ancient Egyptians or the ancient Greek uh, were monotheists. Because the Egyptians believed that there's one supreme like pantheon out there, God. Okay, like in the time of Akhenaten, um, the sun this, okay, the sun ray, the sun this is actually the one supreme God. And Akhenaten actually rejected the other pantheons of God. Um, and, so, uh, and so there's a lot of debate as to why. Uh, and so my position is that it is somewhat monotheistic. But um, again, different scholars have their different opinion. And so my position is that it is somewhat monotheistic. And definitely not the understanding of what monotheism is in the modern world. So, um, somewhat monotheistic basically means that the position of Jews before Hellenism, um, we cannot really say that they are fully monotheism, mon fully monotheistic. Okay, they're somewhat monotheistic. And when Alexander of Macedon conquered, he brought with him pantheons. Of gods, okay. He introduced them to um, not he definitely, um, but the Hellenized culture was brought to the Eastern Mediterranean, and Jews started adopting Greek culture. Um, they were influenced by Greek um, 
philosophy and things like that. And so through generations, they somewhat lost uh, what it, it means to be monotheistic. Okay? Um, by this time, the Levites lost control of the priesthood. Um, the, the Levites, they, they were relegated to become like um, gatekeepers, uh, temple door lockers and things like that. They were, they were becoming cleaners and, and things like that. Um, and so the Sadducees um, became the main, um, was, became dominant in, in this sense. Now, there's a couple of theories as to where the Sadducees came from and, and things like that. Um, but my position is they came from the Levites themselves because it was a practice of the Levites. Okay, Levites came from the descendant of Aaron, the brother of Moses, according to the Hebrew Bible. And they are in charge of the, the, the priesthood, in a sense. And so somewhere along the line, there was a divide between um, the, me, the, the middle class, the lower class, and the upper class of the Levites itself themselves. And then so they became Sadducees, Pharisees, um, and, and things like that. That is my opinion, actually. Um, but again, we don't know uh, for certain because there's various of opinions uh, out there. And so wh whatever the Levites uh, became, um, they became Pharisees, Sadducees, and things like that. And there's a couple of Levites who are uh, being relegated to being the doorkeeper and things like that. Because the Levites, they are in charge of the uh, temple and the priesthood. Okay, They are in charge of the law. They are in charge of um, slaughtering the animals and, and, and things like that. Okay, And the high priests um, were mostly Levites okay, from the descendant of Aaron, the brother of Moses. It wasn't later on until high priesthood um, became, uh, you know, it, wa it wasn't tribal anymore. In a sense, during the time of uh, the first century BCE, but that's a different history. We're not concerning ourselves with that history here. And so, when the Jews adopted Greek um, philosophy and and things like that, we have um, people like Philo of Alexandria, okay, from um, the city of Alexandria, um, by created by the Ptolemies, okay, um, in Egypt, okay, northern Egypt. Um, we watched a, which was a very f um, fantastic city, by the way. Um, it has great ancient libraries uh, as well, even to today. Now, although the the library's been, uh, I mean, refurbished and, and things like that, remade, uh, reconstructed. Um, and so, Philo of Alexandria, he has his theology is definitely not monotheism, uh, because he has this weird, weird theology which we'll not get into. Um, but in a nutshell. Um, Jews that are Hellenized, they somewhat became um, no long. They no longer became strict monotheistic. Um, they became somewhat monotheistic, and and is that they still practice the law? They still do this. They still do that, but they have turned away from the very uh, core methods of their theology, okay, and the law, especially the commandments and and things like that. And so that is why the Islamic position is that God sent um, Jesus to correct them, to bring them back to the strict monotheism of the time of Moses, Isaiah, okay, Jeremiah, um, and, and, and things like that. Um, but that is the Islamic uh, position as well. Um, and so when um, Jesus came, okay, he preached to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he opposed the Sadducees, especially the Sadducees. Uh, not so much the Pharisees, the Sadducees, because they are the one that is in charge of the temple now. Um, but they have made um, the temple became, uh, they have moved away, they have introduced practices that are not supposed to be in the temple. Uh, and that is why Jesus, in the Gospel, in the Synoptics, um, they, he flipped the table of the money changers and things like that. Because all these activities is prohibited, okay? It's prohibited because usury is prohibited in Jewish theology. Um, um, you shall not uh, again the Numbers and Leviticus is is very clear that you shall not defile the temple and things like that. Um, 
And so that's what Jesus came to do, to restore um, the Sadducees or the temple or the Jewish theology. Um, if not theology, then the law back to the time of, uh, of Moses. Um, and so what does this impact? What has this impact on the doctrine, the belief of Jewish theology? Now, a lot of um, scholars are of the opinion that um, the early disciples of Jesus and Jesus himself was a Jew. Um, but what kind of Jew was he? Was he a Hellenized Jew? Like the opinions of uh, M. David Letoir here, okay, in Jesus Deus. That's the opinion. Um, Raymond Brown has a slightly different, different opinion, okay. Um, and my opinion is also slightly different as well. Um, this is something that I, I thought of, um, but definitely someone have definitely put this uh, before me. But the, the, the opinion of David Letoir is that um, Jesus and his surroundings were Jews, but they were Hellenized Jews. And so that is why um, Hellenized Jews is, is believed to be... Um, is Jews that have been Hellenized, meaning they have adopted Greek philosophy. And so they believe in many kinds of divinities. Okay, that is his opinion. Raymond Brown's opinion was that Jesus was a Jew. And by this, I meant um, like he is a strict Jew. Okay, like during the time of Moses and, and, and things like that. Um, my opinion is, is Jesus wasn't a Hellenized Jew. Okay, because if you look at the Sadducees, they themselves were the Hellenized Jews um, and they allowed all these practices to be happening in the temple. Um, but Jesus came to oppose all these practices. Okay? And so Jesus is definitely not a Hellenized Jew because if he's a Hellenized Jew, he would have no problem with these things happening in the temple. Okay? But he opposed all these, uh, these things. Okay? Um, and also... He came to preach the law of Moses. Okay, uh, he came to preach to the Jew, and if you look at it, he is basically restoring the law of Moses. And so Raymond Brown is actually much more correct in his opinion, whereby Jesus came to uh, fulfill the law of Moses. Um, to like, in a sense, he came to um, his theology is not of a Hellenized Jew. Okay, his theology is the one that is Torah based, like really following the law and um, limiting innovation and things like that. But my opinion was that um, not only Jesus came to preach the law of Moses, to restore the law of Moses, but he also abrogates the law of Moses. Okay, he also abrogates uh, the law of Moses. Um, and so we cannot really say that Jesus is a Hellenized Jew. Because that's, that, in my opinion, definitely not a correct uh, representation of Jesus um, and his earlier disciples. Because his earlier disciples, even though they're living in a Hellenized world, but they follow Jesus. Okay? They themselves are Torah observant, um, differently from the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Okay? Their Torah observant is much more towards the time of Moses, the Israelites during the time of Moses. More towards the Torah, the Pentateuch, I meant. Okay. Um, but he also, Jesus also came to abrogate some of the law of law of Moses. Okay. Um, and so, in a sense, Jesus is bringing a new law, a new covenant. Um, and this is what the gospel writers are actually trying to portray. Not so much in Matthew, though, but in Luke um, and as well as in Mark. Um, but there are a group of scholars out there that says that both Luke and Mark have been influenced by Greek um, philosophy, influenced by the Hellenized culture and things like that. And so that is why we cannot really trust their writings as to find the most correct theology of Jesus. Now the question is still up on the table as to what is the real theology of Jesus. Um, and this has been debated by many Christian scholars. Um, Jewish scholars in the minority, but mostly to disprove that, Jew, that Jesus was actually um, a Torah-observing um, um, prophet. Okay? 
because that because Jews reject Jesus. Um, and if you read the Talmud and things like that, um, even though the mention of Jesus and Mary, his mother Mary, is very minute, but I've made a review of this of the book um, by of a book called Jesus in the Talmud. And you can check it out in my channel. But yeah, now I'll bring you the Islamic position. Right, the Islamic position um, is that Jesus was a prophet, and the Quran makes it really clear. Jesus was a Nabi, he was a Rasul, okay, he was both a prophet and messenger. A messenger received revelation. A prophet um, also received some kind of uh, divine revelation and things like that, but it is not um, amongst the, 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 the scripture, okay, the, the great scripture, things like that. Because a prophet can receive uh, revelation from the previous scripture, okay, in a sense. Uh, not necessarily they bring their own scripture, okay. Um, and so, um, Jesus was a prophet sent to the children of Israel, okay. Um, some scholars have tried to limit to, um, to the area of Palestine only. Um, some scholars open it up to all the Jews in the ancient Mediterranean. Um, and that is the opinion that I adopt. Um, because if you look at the New Testament in Matthew, I've been sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Um, not only to the Palestinian. Okay? Not only to the Jews in Canaan, for example. Not only to the Jews in Judea, for example. And so Jesus was sent to um, the, the Jews in general throughout the uh, Hellenized Roman world because that's where Jews were mostly there okay uh, I don't know any instances of Jews in India during the first century or the, the third century BCE um, but ever since the conquest of the uh, Babylon Jews mostly settled in Alexandria in Mesopotamia uh, in Asia Minor in Rome, and so these are the four places that they mostly settled in. Uh, it wasn't until later on whereby they moved to Europe, to Poland, and things like that. Jews don't live in, in Poland, in Germany. Uh, we do not have any evidence that they, they settled there uh, during the 3rd century BCE and things like that. It wasn't until later on. They were kicked out of Europe. Okay, They were kicked out of Europe by, by the Catholic Church, and then only they moved to the Eastern Europe. Okay, to Germany, um, to Slo Slovakia, Poland, and, and things like that. Um, that's la happening later on okay, in, in the history of uh, Europe. Um, but early on, they were only settling in Rome, in Mesopotamia, in Alexandria, when Ptolemy created that, that place by the third, uh, by the, I don't know when he created that, probably the third or uh, BCE or second BCE. Um, second century BCE, I meant third century BCE. Um, because Alexander the Great conquered, and then the empire was only split. He, Alexander the Great conquered in uh, 332 CE, and he died, and he was only split into four of his uh, sons. Um, they fought over definitely. Um, the Seleucids fought over the um, with the Ptolemies, okay, for the land called Canaan and and things like that. Um, the Seleucids were victorious, by the way. So anyway, uh, returning back to our discussion, um, the Islamic position is that Jesus came back to bring monotheism. Um, and it is not the monotheism that is found in the Bible, the monotheism that is found in the Quran. Um, and that is to reject the, di the divinities of other gods, okay? to reject any divine entity, and to only accept one, and that is uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that is the position of the, uh, then that, that is the Islamic position. So anyway, I hope this discussion has been fruitful to you. Um, hopefully it's not too convoluted and easy to follow along. And my name is Arfat, and I'll see you on my next video. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.